the Tuesday, March 10th, 2020 edition of the Clemson Dubcast. We missed last week. Apologies for that. Plan to make up for it this week with two episodes. Just sent in a story earlier this morning about Miles Murphy, freshman, early enrolled freshman defensive end, has already made a major splash. This guy's the real deal, and I got some impressions from fellow players and coaches and such coming up on TigerIllustrated.com later today. Title sponsor of the podcast since the very day we began, Parm Smith and Argentine Law Firm in downtown Greenville. I've known Blake Smith for a long time, I guess about 10 or 12 years ago. He helped me with the situation involving some possible medical malpractice, gave me some great advice, and it wasn't just preferential treatment. That's how he and his staff, which includes Brooke Archenhold, handle every case. They are founded on a dedication to helping injured individuals throughout South Carolina. Free consultations, phone number 864-990-4581 or online at parhamlaw.com, P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parham Smith and Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3507. Okay, visiting with Kelly Gramlich today. Really interesting story. And the most interesting twist is most recently as she joined the ACC Network. Really seems like Kelly's headed for big things, and you'll hear why in this interview. Here we go. Enjoy. Okay, joined by Kelly Gramlich. How are you? Larry, I'm doing great. I'm honored to come on the podcast. Yeah, we're sitting here on a Tuesday morning at the Abernathy, uh, this really nice conference room overlooking, I guess, lower lot two, that would be, uh, sipping on some coffee. And I tell you what, I, there's there are so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, and this sounds bad, like not doing much homework on an interview subject, but I think sometimes it's the best way to have a good interview because it's in real time. So I did a very basic, um, I guess, information gathering mission, and I, I had no idea you you were from Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. That's great. So how did you get to Clemson? Yeah, so I am from Austin, Texas. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm a proud uh, born and raised Texan, and grew up in a sports crazy household. My mom actually played tennis at Duke and was a very good tennis player, Um, but she's from Austin, so she ended up leaving Austin to go to college and go play at Duke. She could have played at University of Texas, but wanted to kind of get out and then came back to Austin, and she's a a lawyer, and she practices in Austin. Um, But when I was growing up, I I just loved basketball, got into basketball. Everything was basketball. My brother and I both, and my, my parents were incredibly supportive and just did my dad, especially just driving us all over the place to play AAU basketball. And so I wanted to play in college that when people asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I literally would say, I want to play college basketball. And then I didn't really know after that, but that's what I wanted to do. And so that's just really was my, my only goal. And initially was getting some interest from kind of some lower level schools in Texas. Um, honestly, wanted to play at Texas. That would have been my dream, but that, that never happened. Um, but then started to get some interest from some other more power five schools. And then Clemson came calling. And I actually, it, you know, you look back on things that happen and you're like, if that hadn't have happened, I mm-hmm. wouldn't be here. And then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But with, there's a big AAU tournament in Virginia. It's called the Boo Williams Tournament. Anybody who plays AAU basketball knows about it. It's huge. And so we went there the um, summer before my senior year of high school, which is kind of your big summer when it comes to basketball recruiting. And I was on a very good team out of San Antonio that had a lot of D1 players on it. So the benefit of that was I got to just shoot (laughs) and coaches came to watch us. And so that was kind of the best thing. I had teammates that went to Texas and LSU and NC State and just all these all these big schools. And so I had a game, I hit eight threes and just came off the bench, knocked on a bunch of threes and I had a good tournament shooting the ball. And Clemson saw me at that tournament. And that tournament I started to garner some more interest from that. But Clemson was one that was really on me from that point and offered me a scholarship pretty early. And um, I had known about Clemson from growing up following the ACC because my mom was a big Duke fan, Duke grad, all that. 
and I came out to visit and just loved it. And it was my one ACC offer, and I, I wanted to play in the ACC, best league in the country. I still think it's the best league in the country, a basketball league first and foremost, which I really liked. And um, so I committed, and I, I made the the leap of coming out here. And I always say, when I was 18, I had no idea how. Really, I was 17. I had no idea how far I was coming from home. It didn't. I don't think you can really process that until you're actually out here. But it also made me grow up really fast and rely on my faith, which was a, a big catalyst for me. And it's the best decision I've ever made. Who was the coach? Coach Coleman. Okay. The Toro Coleman was my coach. Um, and so she played here. Yep. She's a, a legend playing mm-hmm. here. And um, still have a lot of love for her. She she was a great coach, great person. Um, Dutch Coleman is her husband. Love Dutch. A legend in his mind. A legend in many respects. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she actually, they um, parted ways with her after my sophomore year. And I think in many ways, and I don't know if she would tell you this, um, but she was really young when they hired her. She was, I want to say she was 34 or 35. And I just think that it was just, you know, she was really young for that position. Um, but then Audra Smith was my coach and I only played three years. I decided I graduated in three years and decided to focus on grad school and focus on kind of pursuing other careers. Cause I, I didn't want to play basketball overseas. I probably could have tried. I don't know. I just, to me, it seemed kind of silly to try to pursue something that I knew wasn't going to be my career in the end. So, and then I started, um, working as a graduate assistant over in communications with Jeff Callen and did my master's here. And um, Jeff Callen has been instrumental in my career more than almost anybody because he's just given me opportunities and has been a good mentor and friend. And if I hadn't have stopped playing after three years, I probably wouldn't be where I am right now because I decided to just kind of focus on, on what was next. Okay, so had you played another year? You mean play another year and then proceed to play more basketball that's what I'm about. What if you would have? What if you would have just finished out your career at Clemson? You think you still wouldn't have had the opportunity? You know, you never know. Yeah. But I remember it specifically. I stopped. I played. After, I stopped playing for three years. I graduated, and I was. I graduated in three years. So I was kind of figuring out. Okay, do I want to go to grad school? Do I want to move back to Texas? I. You know how you feel when you graduate college. You really don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but Dr. Jimmy Sanderson, who's a professor here, yeah, who him. is now, I believe he's at um, Arizona State now. He's back in Arizona where, where he's from. He was very instrumental with me, and he encouraged me to apply to grad school. And I'm telling you, Larry, at that point, I still had no idea I wanted to be behind a microphone. I, I had no idea. I thought I was going to be a professor, which I always kind of wanted to, I always was interested in education and loved school. So I thought, okay, I'll look at that. And so that's kind of what I went into grad school pursuing. And then I remember it like I was yesterday. I was at Fike, which is right over there where we're doing this interview. And I was on the treadmill trying to stay in shape post basketball. And I don't know if it was, I think it was, it was a God thing, but I would, I just felt this urge. Let me text Jeff and see if I can get back involved and do something because I missed it. I missed being around the sport and I just missed talking about sports and and being involved. And Jeff said, literally, let's meet for lunch the next day. Let's talk about what we can do. And he had me start writing the game stories for women's basketball, the um, press releases and things Mm -hmm. like that. And then that's how I was doing a a game, writing a story for Jeff. And Quok, William Quokkenbush, another legend in his own mind (laughs) and outside of his own mind, Yes, he (laughs) was doing women's basketball radio. And he came over and was just talking to Jeff. And I hadn't really remembered it, but Quok wrote a story on me for the Ibte magazine when I was a freshman, I believe. So I had met him, but I had kind of forgotten about that. And um, we started talking and we started arguing about the Golden State Warriors and <laughs> if they could possibly win an NBA title with their style of play. And of course, looking back on it now, obviously they could. Who was arguing what? Um, I was arguing that they could. We'll just put it out there. <laughs> Because I'm a big Steph fan. And so we started arguing about it, and Jeff just goes, you guys should do this on the radio. Wow. And Quok, being the awesome, gracious human he is, said, come on in. And so I started sitting in like two days a week, and that's when I started getting the, the bug to do a little radio. And then I was hired to be the producer and co-host of Quok's show in April, and then I graduated grad school in May. Okay, so how long were you just going in twice a week? 
I want to say that started in about December, and that's when mm-hmm. Dutch was still the okay. co-host. Yep. And so Dutch decided to move because Coach Coleman was up at Penn State at that mm-hmm. point. And so if Dutch had never decided to move, who knows if I had, if that job would have even been available because Dutch was doing such a great job. And Quack and Dutch had a great chemistry. And so I was coming in, and they were, again, I, I just – I can't overstate how gracious they were because it's tough to just say, "Oh, here's this, here's this girl who wants to come in and talk sports. Let's let's give her the opportunity." And so I thought us three had a good chemistry, um, but you know, Dutch decided to move on, do what was best for him, and then it ended up helping me. So you're just going in basically the, the twice a week thing. You're not getting paid. You're just sort of trying it out, and and they're they're sort of trying you out as well. Yeah, and it's it can be you know we have interns now, and it can take a while for. Uh, for an intern to kind of earn our trust to allow them to speak on certain things. And so I think Quack trusted me pretty early. Um, I, I proved that I had some stuff to add. And I remember they actually added a segment for me on Fridays where I would pose a topic and Quack and Dutch would argue about it. And then I would pick a winner. And so that was kind of fun. Mm-hmm. And it was something unique. And um, that's when I kind of felt, okay, maybe maybe they like me here because they're letting me do this, this sort of segment. And then I started talking with Deborah Jones, who's our general manager, who is awesome. And, uh, it was kind of cool to me too, that there was a female general manager at this sports radio station. I I would have never assumed that, but I think that helped me because the prospect of having a female voice on the station where there wasn't one, I mean, Ramona of course does Walt's Mm -hmm. show. Um, and Ramona's awesome, but I think that kind of made me unique. And that's what I always, I just spoke to the AWSM group on campus, the women in sports media. And I told them, guys, like, it's an advantage. Your voice is unique and different. Mm -hmm. And I think it can help you stand out. Now, you still have to be good. And you might have to prove yourself more than than an average dude in the business. But if you can do that, your voice is different and unique. And there's a whole, I believe there's a whole group of women out there who come to Clemson every weekend and tailgate and spend all these money on tickets with their family and devote all this time to football. And they want to know what's happening and they are educated. And I think when they hear a woman on the radio, maybe it, it, makes them stop and listen a little more because it's someone that sounds like them. I, I don't really have data to back this up, but I think that that is something that's happened with our show, which is is something I take a lot of pride in. Women have to sort of go above and beyond, uh, not just with employers, but with just average male listeners. It's like, okay, who is this? And, you know, does she know her stuff? You know, there there's a skepticism that is usually not present with males and that's not fair, but I'm just curious, you know, what, how, how, how dominant of a topic is that when you're over there talking to aspiring college kids, uh, females? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't sugarcoat it for them. You know, I think it's definitely, uh, you can look at it as a disadvantage if you, if you want to, I, I don't, I don't look at it that way because I enjoy having to prove myself. I'm such a competitive person. I, as uh, you know, I have a chip on my shoulder to a certain extent. And so I like that. I like having to prove myself and I like having to be maybe more prepared than even Quack has to, because he gets more of a benefit of the doubt. Now Quack does his preparation. Do not get me wrong. But I do think initially, you know, people said, who is this? What is this? But I do feel like I've, I've proven myself and we still have, you know, you still get the occasional phone call or the occasional person who calls in and, you know, or Texan and says, Kelly, stick to women's basketball or whatever. Right. But I mean, I, I feel like I've, I've proven my, my football acumen, my basketball acumen. And that's another thing too. I don't think we should just pigeonhole women and say, oh, they're only interested in women's sports because look, if a hundred thousand people are here on an average football weekend, aren't 50, 50,000 of them women. For right. the most part, maybe it's less than that. Maybe it's more. I don't know. But that's something I, I try whenever I get the opportunity to speak to uh, girls who are aspiring to get into this business. I, I, I make sure they know that, yeah, you might have to prove yourself more. But in the end, I think you have to make that an advantage for yourself and, and be the most prepared person in the room and then show what you got. I sort of equate it to, you know, when, when somebody says, oh, that, that analyst, you know, you never played the game. Um, mainly speaking of, of males. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, you know, you got guys who did play the game who were capable of being ten times the moron that this guy who never played the game who prepares and pays attention and does his homework. 
Um, and I, it's the same thing with, with, with women as well. It's about preparation, you mm-hmm. know, like regarding your show um, and what you do. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it still comes down to work, right? Yes. And I think my athlete background really instilled that in me. And I think that's a, a real benefit from being a student athlete is you understand that everything is earned and you do have to work your butt off in, in any profession. But, you know, talk about Quack and I, or even, you know, comparing you and me, I, I, did you play high school football? No. Okay. So, and neither did Quack. So Quack and I have played the exact same amount of football. Mm-hmm. You and I have played the exact same amount of football. I grew up loving football. It was always on in our house. And I think a lot of women grow up that way as well. Now, some women educate themselves more about the game than others. And that's something that, you know, I'll admit, basketball comes a lot easier to me because I did play it. I'm very familiar with a flex cut or Mm -hmm. a pick and pop versus a pick and roll or a slip on a pick and roll. I'm very familiar with that. With football, I have had to educate myself more. Quok is someone who obviously has been such a big part of, of my career, but he is someone that has educated himself to the extreme. And a lot of it actually with him comes from video games of knowing yeah. route trees and things like that. We've had sit downs where Quack has literally been on the whiteboard and I've asked him to explain stuff to me. And I've, I've literally, you know, looked at it like a class. All right, Quack, show me that route tree. Show me what nickel coverage is. Show me this and that. Because I, I under, I think part of Being prepared is also admitting what you don't know and then being able to pursue that. And again, could I talk X's and O's like some players who have played, like my good buddy Eric McLean? Maybe not, but I I still think I can bring a unique perspective that is needed and and that people would want to listen to. I know that back in the dark ages, the late 90s, when I was coming up through journalism school, you know, it was the paths were really sort of clearly defined, you know, like either you went into a newspaper career, Mm -hmm. broadcast career, public relations career. I'm fascinated by now here in 2020 at Clemson's communications school, and maybe even when you were in school, what, what, what were people and what are people aspiring to do right now? I mean, are the women, have they been inspired by Aaron Andrews and people like that? And that's what they are envisioning in general, What is it that makes them choose the communications and sort of quasi-journalism field? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think there are positives and negatives to all these fields kind of merging because I, I do think there are a lot of young people, men and women, who say, I want to get into sports, and then they don't really know what that is. Mm -hmm. They don't really know exactly what they want to do. And then some are kind of left out there floundering a little bit. And there's this idea too, um, that you see, let's say you follow Aaron Andrews on Instagram or something and you follow so-and-so on Instagram and you say, Oh, that looks awesome. Yeah. And you don't understand that, you know, for example, I've been on 60 flights since January 1st. Like you, you don't, and I'm not trying to, to equate myself to Aaron Andrews by any means, but yeah, like you don't, you don't understand the grind. Like I, I do not have a weekend at all ever. Um, you know, it's things like that, that maybe you don't see on, on social media and that's a whole other social media discussion. But I do think a lot of people, social media has has really given the career in sports this kind of platform and it's just not as glamorous as people think but some people pursue it for that maybe for the access um but i do think there are blurred lines and you know my job is is very blurred quack and i will say we aren't journalists you Mm -hmm. know we're not larry williams Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not breaking news we're not doing stuff like that and i think some people especially people who want to be negative on twitter will will say, well, you know, you're just a fanboy or mm-hmm. a fangirl or whatever. And Quack and I don't hide that we're Clemson graduates. I'm wearing my Clemson ring right now. Like, we don't hide that at all. And that's, I think, I would consider myself a sports media personality sure. when it comes to radio. And then on ACC Network, that's a little bit of a different ball game because I'm not going to go on there and, you know, I, I want to, when it comes to my women's basketball and, and some men's basketball stuff, that is pure analyst stuff. I really do try to remove my Clemson hat when I am on ACC Network. Um, but I think, you know, part of what ESPN's done, too, is you look at some of these big names 
that are on some of these big shows and they're not taking away that they went to LSU or Clemson or our Knicks fans or whatever. So I think you have to acknowledge we're all humans and we all have fandom. We're all part of us got into sports because we're big fans. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, knowing when to kind of separate that and knowing when to embrace it. Um, so what's your, I guess it's, it's interesting. You, 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 you know, you point out that, you know, these college kids, you know, look at Aaron Andrews or maybe in my case, they're like, Oh, I want to do what he does, Mm -hmm. you know, and they get into it. But I I mean, I've heard countless interns and prospective interns for us say, Oh, I really love Clemson football. So therefore I want to do that. And so there's this sort of indoctrination period of me saying, you know, it's not about like how big of a fan you are. It's about learning how to write and, and be in a professional setting. So, um, what's the, I guess, what's the, that form of advice that you provide to sort of students now, sort of getting them serious about the realities of the business Mm -hmm. is just basically you telling them about the process of paying your dues and like, where do they start? You know, I mean, most, you know, most students don't get to go right into a, a popular radio show position at the flagship station of a major athletics program. So what are they, I don't know, this is a meandering question, mm-hmm. but I'm just curious, sure. like what are some of the ground level jobs out there right now? Um, not just for females, but for everybody in the, that are coming out of communications. I think that's a great question, and it is not lost on me how lucky I got and how blessed I am to just kind of graduate and end up at WCCP. I, the roar has been awesome to me, and I know that most people don't get to start like that. But one thing that I've actually noticed, and I think a lot of, and I'm not just trying to you know single out women here because I think men do this too and that are trying to get into the business, they all want to be in front of the camera. That is mm-hmm. the main thing in front of the camera, behind the mic, whatever, on social media, that kind of stuff. And one thing that I didn't really know until I started working at ACC Network, and this is something that I feel like if I had known about this career, I might have even pursued this more than being on camera because I never really thought I was going to be on camera. I've kind of stumbled into that. But the production side of, for example, ACC Network has fascinated me. The producer, the director, the AP, the graphics people. There are so many. When we do our Nothing But Net show or all ACC on ACC Network, whether it's a 30-minute or an hour show, there's at least minimum 20 people working behind the scenes on that show. And, for example, being the, the producer... We have different producers that work with us. We had a producer that was with us all last weekend at ACC Network. And we had producer graphics, all stat people. And there's so much that goes into the show where, frankly, the on-air people are not even doing the majority of the work. It, it really blew my mind how much goes into the behind the scenes. And I think if a lot of young people knew more about those careers they would be interested in it. We've, I know um, Kayla Burns Hefner. She's now doing some production stuff for ACC Network. Ashley Pendergast is doing that as well. I work with her on shows. She's our graphics person on a lot of shows. And from what I know, they really enjoy it. And I don't know if it's something that they really knew about. But I'd love to encourage people to, and maybe I'm a voice to tell them more about it, but it's stuff that I didn't even know about. Some of this behind the scenes stuff, I think for me being a producer, if I hadn't gotten into this would have been something I really would have loved to do because you really shape the show and yeah. you give us an outline, you tell us what we're talking about. And then it's our job to come prepared about what we're talking about. And it can go off topic a little bit and whatnot, but there's stuff like that. I mean, our, at the ACC tournament this past weekend, we had probably uh, 20 to 25 people there with ACC Network, just to work on our studio shows. And I think a lot of those careers would be really interesting to young people if they knew a little more about them. Okay, so pre-ACC Network position, your schedule consisted of, obviously, three hours a day on CCP. You also did slash still do the Tiger tailgate show uh, before football Yeah, games? Tiger pregame show. Oh, I'm sorry, Tiger pregame which show? Which is, yeah, people get that confused all the time. Pregame show is our um, CCP show. Okay. Tiger tailgate show is the network show. Okay. Yeah, so I'm still doing pregame show, yes. How many hours is that? That is three hours. So that's okay. uh, six hours before kick. 
Okay. So it can start at 6 a.m. Wow. <laughs> it can start at 2 p.m. It just depends. Mm-hmm. We had basically no noon games this past year, which was a blessing. So that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, also... You did some writing for the Anderson paper, mm-hmm. right? Do you still do that? I, I stopped doing that. Okay. I, was, I did that for, oh gosh, uh, two years about. And that was, I loved writing that column. <gasps> that was something that initially I was writing that for free. And that's something that people maybe, <laughs> people always say that. I didn't know any better. You know, I, they were Freaking kind of those a, papers. I know, Good right? Grief. They were a partner with our station, kind of some advertising stuff. And so I just started doing it. And then I did start getting paid. But, um, you know, some of that is to tell young people who are pursuing, uh, you see maybe on, on Instagram, you see the glamour. There's not a lot of money in it initially. Yeah. You know, you got to do some stuff for free. I know that people say never work for free, but... I don't know, you know, when I was writing that column, yes, I was doing it for free, but I felt like I was getting something in return because thinking, people were reading my yeah. my column in there. Maybe they're more inclined to tune into the radio show or follow me on Twitter or whatever. So I really did enjoy doing that. Um, but once I took this ACC Network job, it truly was not, I did not have time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't currently have time right now. I still, we've talked about me going back and still doing some stuff with them. Great people over there. Um, but yeah, so I was doing that. I was doing pregame. This was all pre ACC network. I was doing our, our show. And I was also, and I still do some of this. Um, I haven't had much, as much time lately. And so my bosses have been uh, understanding of that. But I still run basically all of our social media for the Roar and then help out with other stuff that needs to happen, um, you know, sales presentations, things like that, that they just say, okay, young person, put this together, make it look pretty, yeah. <laughs> which I'm happy to do. So. That's a lot of what I was doing pre-ACC Network. You also dabbled in your having your own show, right? Oh, yes. Week, weeknight? Yes. Or like Wednesday night or, or Saturday morning or something? So before the ACC Network opportunity presented itself, I I love doing our show with Quok. And Quok has made a great effort to make me feel like a true partner, co-host. And that's been a lot of fun. But I also wanted to challenge myself a little more. And so that's when I approached Deb and Ben Milstead about possibly doing my own show. And I just kind of wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone and, and be able to be more of a host and not have Quok to fall back on. And so I was started doing um, the KG show. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just an hour, which looking back now, an hour is so short in yeah. radio land, but it was kind of what I needed at the time. So it was just an hour Saturday mornings. I did that the entire summer of 2018. And some of them, you know, if I was going on a trip that weekend or something, I'd record um, on Friday or whatever. And I had guests on, a lot of great guests that were willing to come on. So that was a great learning experience for me to do that show and kind of be pushed out on my own. And now I feel very comfortable um, hosting if, you know, if Mickey's out, he'll ask me to host sometimes. If Quack's out, I'll just host our show. I've filled in for Walt. So that's really propelled me into being able to do that. And the best thing about radio, I think that's another avenue that maybe young people don't know as much about getting into radio Yeah, because I didn't know much about it, to be honest. But when I was hired by ACC Network and my, my bosses there still tell me this, that they didn't want me to stop doing the radio show because radio is daily reps. It, mm-hmm. it forces you daily mm-hmm. to think on your feet, to add to a conversation, to, you know, bring up a new topic, whatever it is that I think without a doubt, if I have not I'm coming up on doing four years of radio, which is mind blowing, by the way. But radio has, without a doubt, prepared me for what I'm doing now on ACC Network. It's made me so much better. Happy to have Founders Federal Credit Union on board as a sponsor with us. If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to Founders FCU. Dot com. You know, quite often during the week, early in the morning, go work out in lot two near the stadium and the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. The parking lot is full. What a wonderful addition to the Clemson community. The Abernathy has become a very popular lodging spot for all the ESPN personnel who frequent this place on such a regular basis these days. Taps Bar and Cafe, a great place for some of you professors and university types to wind down after work during the week. They also have a new Dabo room that they have recently unveiled. So looking forward to seeing that. Learn more about all this at theabernathy.com. It's really interesting you say that the daily reps, uh, it's the same way with writing. Like, 
if I if I had to write one thing yeah. a week, it'd be really hard to sit down and write that one thing. But since I'm writing every day, it's like you could do it in your sleep almost sometimes. So so um, the the summer show that you had, I'm, I try to put myself in you guys' shoes. The summer seems like the worst <laughs> freaking time <laughs> of the year because this is wasteland, you know, of of stuff actually happening unless there's a scandal or for sure. arrest or something like that. And so you've already you've already gone 15 hours of talking during the week with it, it, in your show with Qualk and then you've got to talk about other you know, even more stuff. It was it is that and was that a challenge? It was. It was and I liked it. I had to kind of figure out different topics to bring up. One thing I started doing which actually helped me was whatever I would write my column on, I would kind of turn that into a segment. Mm -hmm. So it worked out that way. And that's something, the column was great too, because it made me think of a unique topic almost every week to write about. And they didn't say it had to do with Clemson. It could have been, you know, anything. So that really helped me too. But that is something, and you know, I would never, ever complain about this job because it's, it's the best, but June and July can be difficult and mainly June, July, you kind of get into ACC kickoff Mm -hmm. and people are starting to get really excited. June, some of May, it's a real challenge. And Quack and I both really like that. And it'll kind of force us to over prepare, bring unique topics, bring different ideas. There's certain ideas that we'll find during the year and we'll just table it and we'll say, all right, that's a summer topic. We'll talk about that in the summer. And it really with us, and I can only speak to our show. It, it's I'm sure it's difficult for other shows or other people who truly host a show by themselves. But Quack and I are so lucky that we have each other with this show because I truly believe if you gave Quack and I a topic, like you said, all right, that fake plan over there, talk about it for a segment. I think Quack and I could do it. I really do. <laughs> and we just got lucky. I, I think so much of life is just kind of making the most of what's given to you and, and kind of getting lucky at times. But Quack and I are really good friends. He is one of my my good friends. And we have a good chemistry. And you can't – it just happened to happen. You know, we were just kind of thrown together, and it works. And some people don't don't end up having that chemistry for whatever reason. It's not necessarily their fault. It just is what it is. But – we got lucky because I, I truly enjoyed doing that show with him, and I think he, he enjoys doing it with me. I think so. Well, yeah. who knows? <laughs> Do you feel a responsibility to know, to have a general knowledge of everything that happened last night? Like, so if somebody calls and asks you about, hey, what do you think about the Lakers? Do you feel like you need to know, or, or, or do you, do you, do you, or, do, do you, think you know what i'm going to i'm going to have my thing and i'm going to plead um i'm going to i'm going to fully disclose that hey i don't i don't watch the nba so don't ask me about that or major leagues or whatever or 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 are you like you try to be all knowing well you know you can try i think we all if you say i watch everything and i am an expert on everything you are probably not. Let's just be honest. It's it's impossible to do that. Now, some people do watch a good amount of everything and maybe a little more, but I think part of it is, you know, in radio, yes, do I want to know what happens last night, particularly if it's a Clemson event, you got to know. If it's a big NBA game, if it's a big football game, I try to make myself aware. And if I don't watch it the night before, the beauty of something like watchespn.com is I can go on there and watch it in the morning. But there is a balance. Like sometimes I have a life. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm out to dinner with, with my fiance or sometimes I'm out with friends or traveling or whatever. So and that's the beauty of kind of having quack is that there is that safety net of, okay, maybe you didn't get a chance to watch this. I watched it or vice versa. And that's something that has been more of a struggle for me recently with ACC Network because I have been so busy. And this is my first season kind of doing two jobs, really. And so it has been an adjustment of, okay, I was literally on air last night. So I didn't get a chance to watch this. I'm catching up on my plane ride back. I'm saying, Quack, give me a few bullet points. And again, back to Quack just being great with all this. He's He's been really um, understanding of my schedule. But, you know, with Twitter and with the internet and with these streaming services, 
you can you can go find something. And so that is truly a positive. I'm not sure how, you know, like you said, the dark ages back in the day. If you missed a game, you missed a game. And so that would have been really difficult to do radio in that time where if you're not watching the game, then you really can't prepare yourself for the show. Is there pressure to have a take on everything? And, even, and, and are there times when you don't have a take and you kind of feel like you have to manufacture one just because that's the market, I guess? That is definitely a growing sentiment, I think, especially in radio. And even, you know, on some of these shows, I think if you're on a big TV show that is on every day and that's kind of your persona, you might feel more of a pressure to have a take. I don't necessarily feel pressure to have a take on everything. I generally have a take mm-hmm. on most things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why my personality is good for radio. If if you don't have a take on most things, maybe your maybe radio's not your not your gig and there's plenty other plenty of other things for you to do. There are a few times if we're just being completely honest, especially maybe in like June or something, right? Where Quack and I get on a topic and we just start arguing about it and we'll go to the break and we both just say whatever. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> so occasionally you do have to do that. And that's part of kind of playing it up for the show and, and being entertaining. I think first and foremost, we are entertainment. You know, I, I see our show like that. I think if one thing I've always said is if Quack and I are laughing, I think you're laughing like in the, sh- in the car, if you're listening, if we're laughing, I hope you're laughing. If, if we're arguing, I hope that you're thinking, okay, which side am I on? If we're bringing energy, then I hope you're having a good time listening to the show. So I don't, I don't feel pressure to have a take on everything, but thankfully with my personality and just the way my brain works, I generally have a take on most things and Quack has a take on everything. <laughs> so that does help the show. A very impassioned <laughs> take. And it wouldn't be very good radio if everything, everything you said was, yeah, I agree, Quack. Like that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't be all that, all that compelling. So, all right. ACC network courtship. When did that start? And what were the mechanics behind that? This is a crazy story. It really is. And I was actually talking about it with um, Aaron Katzman, who's the coordinating producer for ACC Network. I was talking about him, talking about it with him this weekend because I was kind of asking him about it. So really what happened, I knew ACC Network was coming. And in the back of my mind, that was always a goal. But one of the frustrating things about this business is there isn't really a template. You know, if you're in a different field, you say, all right, I'm currently in this position. I will do a good enough job and then I'll be promoted to this position and this position. That's really not how sports media works. So I always saw ACC Network on the horizon and I thought that was something I would want to do. And I felt like I could do that well. So then my buddy, Eric Macklin gets hired by Mm -hmm. ACC Network. And first of all, that was so exciting. So pumped for him. He's done an awesome job. And so once he got hired, he was telling me more about it and he kept saying things like, we got to, we got to get you on this. We got to get you up here. And so it all started with Mac who I really didn't ask to do this, but Mac literally started talking me up to people. I, he just, mm-hmm. he just did because Mac is a, is a great friend. He's one of the, he's literally the third person I met at Clemson. We wow. met in Clemson house in our summer when all the athletes came in in the summer before freshman year. And he's been a great friend ever since then. So he started talking me up and then I think because he was talking me up, and this is such a modern story, Aaron Katzman, who's the coordinating producer, he followed me on Twitter. And this was, gosh, June, did I want to say. Did you know who he was? I did not. Okay. But I, when he followed me, it's his bio said ACC Network, and I texted Mac, and I was like, who is this? And Mac told me. So I followed him back. And in pure social media form, I thought, okay, he followed me. I can message him. And I had a reel made. I For two years in a row, I'd made a reel of all the stuff I had done with um, Rick Bagby's team over there with ACC Network Extra. Rick has been awesome, giving Video me a bunch stuff. of opportunities. Yeah, so it's basically you're doing a broadcast. It's just streaming, and you've got a producer, you've got a director, you've got graphics, you've got everything. And so I made a reel from that um, of the – I called the Clemson-Notre Dame game, Clemson-Louisville, and then the Clemson-Radford men's game. And I made about a six-minute reel. I've some of my best stuff from those three games. And I had been sending it out to a lot of people. And I'd asked Rick to send it to people, and Rick had been really helpful. And I thought, what the heck? I sent it to Aaron. I, I DM'd him on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And the main thing I said was, I wasn't asking for a job. I was asking for notes. I said, here's my mm-hmm. real, would love your thoughts on it. That's all I said. And um, 
to my surprise, he responded and he gave me a good, a bit of notes and it was really helpful. And he said, this is really good. Here's some things you can work on. And so I thought that was that little did I know. And Aaron just told me this actually last week that he saw the reel. He said he watched the first 30 seconds and he sent it to his boss and wow. said, we need to hire her. I mean, I, that, that has to give you goosebumps. Oh yeah. I'm getting them right now. I, it blew me away that he told me that, but, um, Back to what I knew. So I thought, okay, great. This was a good good connection to make. We'll just move on with our lives. And then ACC kickoff happens, which I know you attend every year, Larry, in Charlotte. Eh, sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes. Uh, media event in Charlotte for ACC football. And Quack and I go every year with the radio show. They have a big radio row. It's a really fun event. And I knew Mac was going to be there, of course. I was looking forward to seeing Mac. And I thought, okay, there's some ACC people here. Maybe I'll run into Aaron. Who knows? But I hadn't had any plans. And I remember getting to my hotel room, putting down my bag and Mac texts me and says, Aaron's down here. He wants to meet you. Wow. (laughs) I'm like, okay, great. (laughs) So I, uh, check my hair, whatever, go downstairs. And Mac introduced me to Aaron. And then there's also a guy there named Patrick Donaher who I meet and we're talking, we seem to hit it off. And, um, then Patrick looks at me and he says, I'm going to call you. And I said, Okay, great. And then actually the next week, I went on vacation to Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> and so I thought, well, if he calls me, you know, the six-hour time difference, I might not answer, whatever. Uh, about a month and a half goes by, and I get a call from Patrick the day after I got engaged. Wow. It, it's just a crazy story. So we got engaged on that Thursday in se- early September, and then Patrick called me the Friday after. And I, the phone rang, and it was a Connecticut area code. And I thought... All right. So it had been six weeks since okay. he had told me he was going to call me. And I answered. And Patrick is actually, he's like the senior talent uh, hire person. I don't even know what his title is. He's, you can't Google him because I tried. He's very <laughs> off the grid. And he said, uh, we want to hire you. I don't have the details yet, but don't move to Europe. That's literally what he said to me. <laughs> Basically, stay local because we want to hire you. And I thought, all right. And then September 30th, he called me back. So another month went by. And he said, here's the deal. Here's what I want you to do. Um, And I said, great, I'm in. And so that whole time, uh, just to be honest, I wasn't telling really anybody. Quok knew uh, because I felt like I owed Quok that for him to to give him a heads up. Um, And then I, once I officially had the offer, I told some of the higher ups at WCCP and Ben Milstead and Deborah Jones are were so great. And they said, I told them first off, I want to keep doing this show. And they said, great, we're going to make it work. And, um, I just wanted to make sure Quok was on board first before I went to them. And so my, I was hired then signed the contract. And then my first show, I went up at the end of October and there was a preview show that they did. There were the, we did a basketball preview show. That was my first time in Bristol. I got my ID badge, all this stuff. It's pretty overwhelming to mm-hmm. your first time to be on ESPN's campus. And then we taped a show. And I was in two segments. And I had never been more nervous in my life. <laughs> but I did it. I felt like it went pretty well. And then ever since then, I've been going up. So especially January, February has been very busy. I, I generally am in Connecticut every Thursday. And then on the weekends, I'm either in Connecticut on Sunday or I'm doing a game on Sunday. And so January and February have been pretty crazy. And then we just did the ACC tournament. We were in Bristol Wednesday, Thursday doing shows. And then we flew directly to Greensboro, did a show Friday. And then this past weekend, actually, they asked me to do sideline for the ACC semifinals and championship game, which I'd never done. So that was a learning experience. I have so much more respect for people like Holly Rowe who do sideline and do such a good job because it's a very different kind of task, but it was a lot of fun. And then we had a bunch of studio shows. We were up kind of above the court, did a post game show. Um, the people have been awesome. The, the people at AC's network have just been great. The people that I've worked with Kelsey Riggs and Monica McNutt and Elena Beard, those, they've become such good friends in like two months. So it's been an awesome experience that it has been, uh, an adjustment and, you know, at, there are times where these 6am flights have really gotten old because I'll fly up Wednesday after our show. I will not be on the air Thursday. I'll I'll film Thursday. We generally go on air at 10 p.m. And then I will drive back to the hotel, and I'll wake up at 5. I'll get on a 6 a.m. flight. I'll get back here, and I'll do the show at noon on Friday. On Friday. Yeah. And you won't be on CCP on Thursday? Right. So I've really just been missing one day a week. 
And wow. this past week, I had to miss a few more because um, just logistically, if Quok is on the road with women's basketball or something, we can't both be on air from a hotel room. One of us has to be in studio. So that's just kind of the logistics okay. part of it. All right. So rewinding back to your highlight reel you put together that you sent to him, what did you... like? What was good in your mind? Like, what, what made you choose the clips you chose? Was it like an insight you gave on a play, or, you know, or something like that? And then what was the constructive criticism that you were given from, um, I'm sorry, what's his first name? Aaron. Aaron, Aaron yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, let me rewind a little bit because when I was making the reel, uh, I consulted Roy Philpot, who okay. has been a great friend to me and a mentor. And Roy, for some of your listeners that might not know, if you don't know Roy, I mean, come on. But he's all over the place. He's all now. over the place. He had our time slot at CCP yep. for the longest time, and then he went full time with ESPN. So he does play by play for football, women's basketball, men's basketball, baseball, everything. And we've kept in touch, and he's been so great to me. The, the first person. After I got offered the job, I called my dad, and then I called Roy Hmm. to ask him about it because he told me, call me the second you get an offer, we're going to talk about it. And he gave me great advice. And so with my reel, initially, I sent my reel to Roy, and he kind of told me what I needed to do in terms of the length, specific clips. And so the very first clip I opened with, and I think this clip got Aaron's attention, and shout out to Rick Bagby, who gave me the ability to use the Telestrator on the ACC Network Extra broadcast. I don't know how many... ACC Network extra broadcasts Mm. around this conference have a Telestrator handy for their analysts. But Rick was always very, you know, good at getting me on the Telestrator, as we called it, the Kellistrator, and, uh, (laughs) you know, allowing me to use that and get better at it. So the very first clip, Asia Durr, when Louisville came to play, Clemson Asia Durr was the two-time ACC Player of the Year. I think the number three overall pick in the WNBA draft, baller. She, against Clemson, comes off this stagger screen on a uh, baseline out-of-bounds play and get, goes off the screen, hits like a fadeaway three, and I telestrate it, and I break it down. And that was the very – and I thought I, I didn't, you know, I didn't stumble over my words. It was a really good one. I I'd kind of drawn it out. And someone like Asia Durr gets your attention from the mm-hmm. jump, I think, because if you're in this business, you know who she is. So that was the first play. I had on there, and I started with Telestrator. I think I had two Telestrator clips. I made sure I really wanted to put Notre Dame and Louisville on there because those are two of the best teams in the country, and I thought that would get attention. And then I wanted to put um, a men's game on there because Rick allowed me to do a good amount of men's games, and I still have aspirations to do some men's basketball and um, be a color commentator with that. So I thought that that, those would be good. And then one thing Roy told me was shorten it because you don't – I, I originally had probably eight to ten minutes, and Roy's mm-hmm. like, no, 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 no. So I think it was about four and a half. So just quick, I had, uh, I was, I was pretty decisive on my my halftime segments, where I said, look, this is what this team needs to do, and that's something I had made a reel the previous year, and Roy had given me notes on that, and and that's kind of what he told me is, you are the expert. You cannot approach a game and look like you're doubting anything you're saying. You have to, and it's kind of that fake it till you make it, show up with confidence even if you don't have it. And I I did have it to a certain extent, but he's like, you need to convince me that I need to listen to you, that you are the expert. And so that's some of the best advice that Roy gave me. And also, when I first started doing games, I, I looked less comfortable. I smiled less. I was pretty serious. And that's one thing Roy told me too is like this these are sports. This is fun. You gotta smile a little more. And once that's always me. When I get comfortable, then I start showing my personality. Mm-hmm. And I think that's almost anybody. But I've gotten a lot more comfortable on air, whether it's radio and then games and stuff like that. So those are two of the big pieces of advice Roy gave me. And Roy has been just really such a great mentor and he was texting me last night about the sideline stuff I did and um, telling me he thought it was pretty good give me a few pointers there and I'm really thankful for him if you're in the eastern midlands and pd area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home commercial property land need to consider reaching out to uptown realty they're based out of sumter and run by a friend of mine patrick enzer big clemson guy used to cover the tigers in a newspaper capacity longtime supporter of tiger illustrated longtime listener to the dubcast the home buying process should be an enjoyable experience so let patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting all you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774- 
888-242-0435 or go to Uptown Realty SC. Com. Harris flooring has been a major part of the facilities enhancements over at Clemson, not just with athletics, but also at the university level. And we are thrilled that they are a part of the Dubcast as a sponsor. Since 1947, the Junkins family and Harris flooring have provided a unique shopping experience through value in their services, developing the right product solutions and delivering on their promises. To check out some reviews on their work, just go to their Facebook page, Harris Flooring America. Rave reviews, just first class all the way. Phone number Number 864-642-6183. What makes sideline reporting so different and what makes it hard and what makes Holly Rowe and people like that so good at what they do? Okay, so we've talked about this. I am a person of preparation. Like when I do a game, I have a board that I make every time and I have everything on there I could need. And, you know, when you're doing the game, the action is what speaks for itself. You are commenting on the action. When you're sidelined, you have to go find the story because they don't really need you to, to give your take on the action. They have the analyst to do that. And that's something I kind of learned on the fly this past weekend. So I, you have to get in those huddles. I mean, it's that's, reporting. Yeah, it's reporting. And I'm, I'm not really used to that. Mm-hmm. It, I'm used to giving my opinion. And one thing that Roy told me about sideline was it's not about you. Find the story. It's not about you and your thoughts. It's about what's happening in that huddle and what's happening with that review and what's happening on the sideline. So that was really interesting to me. And I felt like I really got the hang of it towards the end of just kind of asserting myself and just literally standing in Florida State's huddle, not caring that, you know, they're thinking, okay, why is this girl here? Because we got approval to do that. So getting in the huddles, finding out what's happening, um, bothering the trainers. And saying, give me some more information on her. She got uh, beat up in that last game. And bothering the SIDs and saying, I, who's here? Whose family is here? And then the really interesting experience was, because it was the championship game, so NC State won, and the balloons are falling, the confetti's falling, and my producer is in my ear saying, I need Kunane. We're two minutes till off air. You have to go get her. you got to get like. It's a pressure situation. So I'm running out there in my heels, trying not to (laughs) fall on balloons, and talking with the SID. Kunane, of course, is a player. She's trying to celebrate. She's trying to hug every teammate. We have to literally drag her out of the celebration, and we get her on air, and we got a few questions in, and I thought it, it really was good. But there's just so many aspects to it, and you can't really prep. I mean, you can prep, but... In the end, you got to go find something interesting that you can add. And I think, yeah, Holly Rowe does such a good job with that. You, you're, the, the notion of preparation, you, you, you can only prepare enough. My pet peeve for the sideline reporter is they've done a ton of, you know, prep going in, and so they're telling you good stories. It's like at halftime, you know, there could be like a Hail Mary for a touchdown. Sideline reporter said, you know, 30 seconds later, sideline reporter says, Coach, you were concerned about your running game coming in. Can you talk about that? I'm like, dude, it just, it just happened. You, it's not that hard to adjust. Like, what happened on that last play, Coach? Like, do you notice that too? Um, just as a sort of a matter of, like, like we say, reporting, like reacting to what just happened. Maybe sometimes sometimes the sideline reporter doesn't do that enough. Sure, yeah. And, again, I've only done sideline for three games, and I didn't bring any pre-prepared questions. I was really trying to ask from what we just saw. But one thing um, that people don't know, and I did not know this, for example, on a few of those interviews this past weekend, mainly the ones at the end of the game, The producer was in my ear telling me what to ask. Telling you what to ask, yeah. And so sometimes you don't necessarily have a choice. Uh, And so just that's something that I know now. Now, who knows if they're asking that question on their own volition or not. But, uh, you know, and that's something that people don't really understand is how much a producer runs a broadcast and how much they're in charge and how much work they do. And and, um, I think that's just such an interesting job. And they do such great jobs for us. But, yeah, I, I try to really, okay, what just happened? ask the coach, get their real-time reaction. But, I mean, I'm still learning. And there are times where the producer is like, I want mm-hmm. you to ask this, and, and you got to do it. 60 flights, you said, uh, for, <laughs> since, since it January was, 1st? So two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, it was 50. So I'm assuming I'm at 60 now. I could be at, like, 58. Wow. Yeah. Well, because coming out of Greenville, I have to, I have to go to Atlanta. So that's what adds yeah. on to it. So... 
I, this came up when I interviewed Eric, uh, I guess. I forgot when that was. Maybe last fall, last mm-hmm. summer. I, I was mistaken. I thought that a lot of these operations were going to be in Charlotte. But they're in Bristol. Why Why is that? I thought so, too. Uh, it's a little unfortunate for people like Mac and I. So the SEC network is in Charlotte. And they're based out of Charlotte. And I think initially they thought about putting the ACC network in Charlotte because that would make a lot of sense geographically. But I think it was more affordable, is what I heard, to keep it in Bristol because they have the studio built up there and they just have an infrastructure in Bristol that they don't have in Charlotte. So, you know, all the people that work behind the scenes on our shows are all based in Bristol. And really it's just the talent that has to fly in. And, you know, I've never been to the ESPN campus in Charlotte, but I can't imagine it has the resources that we have in Bristol. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it's all for the best, but yeah, if it was in Charlotte, that would help me a little bit. (laughs) So, all right. So are you purely basketball and during the fall pre basketball season? Are you, what are your responsibilities with ESPN? I am purely basketball right now. So I, um, I don't want to give too many details on just the contract and stuff, but I am, I am basketball. And I have a specific amount of hits uh-huh. that I will do. Um, and uh, that's what I'm doing this year, and I will do that next year as well. And I don't have any other non-basketball responsibilities as it stands now. I, I could work into that. I really don't know. Um, I've, I've done a little men's basketball, which I want to, you know, we'll see what happens there. But at times with our Nothing But Net show, which is our Sunday night show, they, they'll have me on the panel. They've also had Monica, one of my uh, co-hosts on the, plan, on the panel, too, to talk a little men's basketball, which we love doing. And then we always joke, like, all right, guys, you going to stay on the, for the women's segment? You know, let's, let's go. <laughs> so that's something that is kind of an added bonus from doing the radio show is I, I have to know what's going on with men's basketball, and so that kind of helps me on air. But uh, I think uh, Monica and I, both of us with, that are women's analysts, we really do try to – to make people know that we can talk men's basketball too. If you want to talk, let's, let's break it down. And basketball is basketball. Ball is ball. You know, Mm -hmm. we can, we can break down that, that tape just like someone else can. So I would say basketball analyst, that's what I am. And that's what I'm doing right now. And, and I'm, I'm kind of, that, that sounds good to me right now, Mm -hmm. just because I'll get a little time this summer when I'm just doing the radio show to relax a little bit and, and get a little R and R. I can, I, I really can't imagine if you, are there aren't many ACC network people that do everything, but for example, Kelsey Riggs, who is a host and awesome person, she does every sport mm-hmm. and she lives up there. But for example, on Saturday, this past Saturday, she hosted our pregame show in Greensboro for the women. She got in a car, drove to Durham, and hosted a pre and post game show for the Duke UNC men's game. So she did three shows on two different sports in one day. And to have the names and numbers and teams and coaches all, yeah. you know, and just make that transition, that, that's just really impressive. So there are some people that do multiple things, and, and those people just kind of blow me away. Okay, your take on men's basketball. What happened the last <laughs> couple of games? Oh, man. I, you know, this team, I think that it was, it was constructed in a way that I think Coach Brownell kind of had to because you lose all those seniors. It's the nature of basketball now. It's a lot of these programs are built on transfers. But I think when you bring in transfers, it's just tough to ask a team to really know its identity right off the bat when these guys join in in July or whatever it was. And you go over to Europe and that all went well. But one thing with this team that kind of surprised me because Brownell's never really done this is they're so reliant on the three Mm -hmm. and they're shooting so many threes. And I think it's pretty simple if, if they make some threes, they they could beat anybody as, as is shown. If they don't shoot the ball well, it's, it's going to be kind of ugly. And so I think that's been the issues. They've been so reliant on the three ball. And I think a lot of basketball is shifting that way, but good teams can beat you and score in a variety of different ways if they're not making if they're not making the three. But I do think that it is encouraging to look ahead because I know Clemson fans never want to hear that, but you're losing Tevin Mack, you're losing Curran Scott. That's really it. You have a guy like Alamir Dawes, who I think is going to be a great four-year player for you. You have Amir Sims as a senior. You're bringing back a lot of key pieces. So I think expectations should be and will be higher next year. Um, but, you know, it was just an interesting, interesting year in ACC yeah. men's basketball. Very interesting. Not only did you lose those one-and-dones, but you lost pretty much every all-ACC team 
player from last year. And so there was a lot of rebuilding across the board and a lot of inconsistencies. And, um, you know, that's kind of the nature with men's basketball now. And I make this point when you contrast men's basketball and women's basketball. For example, when NC State won this past Sunday, Ace Koenig, who is a senior point guard for NC State, great player, great shooter, second best shooter in school history. And uh, she gets up there. She's the MVP. She gets up there and she talks about how much Coach Westmore means to her, how much this program means to her. And you can just see how much work she's put into that program for four years. And I think it, it's just it's a better fan experience to a certain extent with the women's game right now if you really take the time to educate yourself and watch because that's what we used to have in the mm-hmm. men's game. These four-year players that have put everything yep. into that program and to win an ACC championship. NC State had not won one in 29 years. To go win it after four years in that league and you know Louisville didn't win it, Notre Dame didn't win it. What a story. And that's something that I think we're missing right now from men's basketball. Well, it just feels weird. Senior night. Tevin Mack right, and Kara Scott. Right. Oh, man, we've been through so much together yeah. for the last year. It's just you not know? the same. It's not the same. I, you know, the strangest thing to me about this team, I mean, I, I think they've overachieved, um, evidenced by those huge wins over the top, I guess, top six teams. Yeah. But there have been occasions where you go from going wow this team is so resilient to then in the next game going wow this team looks so soft you know like at Georgia Tech a week and a half ago Amir Sims was a an absolute beast in the first half and then just disappeared in the second and the whole team just looked kind of soft same thing at Virginia Tech Mm -hmm. and same thing to a large degree I guess for the last 15 or so minutes at home against Georgia Tech the other night, so I'm not sure. I mean, you would think that as you're playing for your postseason lives that you get stronger and tougher and, and you have built on the experiences you've had to date, but I don't know I don't know if the if they got chewed too much after Virginia Tech and maybe they sort of checked out a little bit mm-hmm. mentally. Uh, do do you do you agree that it's been that's been part of the strangeness, that alternate resilience on one hand that's so impressive and then it's like where did that go on the other i agree and i think consistency is one of the toughest things to achieve in college sports and we see it across the board and you know when you think back of the best teams that brownells had i mean the team that really stands out to me is the sweet 16 team obviously and i this is one of my takes if you will i'm doing air quotes but I strongly believe this, and I think if you look at um, a lot of the great women's teams right now and a lot of the great men's teams of old, pre-one and done, when you have experienced junior, senior guard play, that's when you can be consistent. And I think Amir Sims is a great player, and he's, he's, he's really, I probably overachieved here at Clemson, but teams that I think go far and teams that are most consistent week in and week out to me, their best player or their go-to guy is a guard. Mm -hmm. That's what I prefer. And you saw it with the Sweet 16 team. You had a guy like Shelton Mitchell and Marquise Reed. And even Gabe DeVoe was the best player on that team Mm -hmm. in February and March. He was a four-year guy. He had put blood, sweat, and tears into that program. And he was so consistent. And these guys, there's consistency from guard play that we're not seeing on this team. Dawes is a freshman. I think Dawes can develop into someone as a junior and senior that is going to make this team very consistent and, and very tough to beat. But John Newman has has had games where he's he's posterizing guys, mm-hmm. and then he has games where he just disappears. Tevin Mack is a guy who's been here for nine months, and he's very talented, but he can disappear. These other guys have been hurt. Hemingway has been hurt. To me, it, it comes down to guard play. The most consistent teams in college basketball have – experienced guards and even someone like Duke right now Trey Jones he's a sophomore but I think he you can put him in that category a little bit Florida State has great guards Louisville has really good guards Uh, Virginia has Mm -hmm. guards that have been there that's what it comes down to for me and you know some people might push back against that and can cite other instances but I think guard play is just supremely important Mm -hmm. in college basketball 
If you're a business owner and your business involves credit card processing, you need to reach out to Tandem Innovative Payment Solutions. A lot of different ways that Tandem can improve your bottom line by shaving off some of those expenses. In addition to processing credit card payments, Tandem also manages inventory, schedules staff, tracks sales, gains insight into customers, and gets transaction reports. With Tandem, you're not a number, you're a neighbor. Learn more about Tandem at tandempayment.com. Last question, because you got a, a show to get, get ready for. <laughs> um, as you're sort of trying to form your own reality and opinion, sort of a reasonable sort of middle of the road, I guess, take on things. An example, in this case, being, you know, Brad Brownell basketball program. How do you, when you have, you know, a bunch of callers who are maybe the vocal minority, Twitter you know the, the the vocal folks who were, you know, um, fire him right now. I'm sick of him. Whatever. You know, message board mm-hmm. in, contingent. Those tend to be um, the more, I guess, extreme voices. How do you both sort of acknowledge those voices and, and respect them, but also um, maybe um, keep them in perspective as you try to arrive at your own opinion. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes. And I I think being on the radio and having a voice and a platform, I think it's more important for me, even though I am a fan and I went to Clemson, I think you have to bring a rational approach to these types of things. And I think part of it too, because I've been a student athlete, I understand the reality that, look, Brad Brownell is a friend. He, he's a friend of mine. He's very, he's was very good to me when I was a player. Brownell used to go out of his way to talk to me, to, um, comment on a recent game, to comment on my shot. He would let me sit in practices mm-hmm. and just watch. And I don't think he let a lot of people do that, but I would go up there if I had some free time in little John, I was just interested. I would just sit up in the, in the higher seats and just watch. And he always let me do it. And I even talked to coach Bender about it recently. And he's like, yeah, we saw you up there. We, <laughs> we didn't mind it. So I, I think Brownell is just, um, he's been really good to me and I, I am a fan of what he does. Here's the thing though. And I think you have to bring this rational level. I understand that Clemson fans are, are frustrated. I understand making two tournaments in 10 years is, is not ideal. And that's something that Clemson fans don't love totally understand. But here's the other part of it too. You can't apply football expectations to basketball. You have to look at the history. You you have to approach this from a rational approach and say, look, you made a sweet 16. This program has made very few sweet 16s ever. He did that. He's constantly on the bubble. He's constantly in postseason play, whether it's the NCAA or the NIT. That is pretty darn good. I'm not saying you shouldn't hope for more, but I think you have to acknowledge that that is pretty darn good when you look at the history of Clemson basketball. And then once you look at all those facts, if you if you still, as a fan, believe we want to move on, that's great. Give me a name. <laughs> Who are you replacing him with? That's the other thing, too. It, you, I think you just have to be a little more rational about this. And there's not just a tree of coaches out there that you can just pick one off and say, all right, things are definitely going to be better. The grass is not always greener. And... You, I think you just have to look at the history of Clemson basketball and have some perspective of what he's done because I think overall he's done a pretty darn good job. And, you know, Brownell's very honest with himself he, and honest with the fans. He'll tell you when he thinks he didn't do a good job, and he'll tell you when he thinks a team underachieved or whatnot. Um, you know, you look at the wins this year. You look at the position they're in. Of course, would you rather be on the on the bubble and possibly in the tournament? Yes, but did anyone, did any fans really expect this team to make a tournament? I I really don't think so. So it's all about having that perspective and kind of taking, taking the fanhood out a little bit, but also respecting that fans want to be able to go to Little John and see a team that's going to make the tournament. I think there's a fine line to balance, but I I don't ever think it's black and white. There, there's a gray area in there and you do have to remember that you're dealing with with human beings and, and with people. Um, so that's just something I would encourage people to remember. But I'm not saying I don't hear people's frustrations and maybe don't feel them. I think a, a lot of, you know, I want to see this team play in the tournament. I think anybody does. So just kind of approaching it from that nuanced perspective and presenting both sides. Yeah, and while, and while you have on one side the, these this faction of people who say it's time to make a change, on the other hand, you have to acknowledge 
that at at home games recently the fans have shown yeah, up. Yeah, the crowds you know? have been great. Um, you know, it'd be one thing if if there were if it were half full uh, every every night, but it seems like, and it's hard to it's hard to make a blanket statement when you're talking about nine or ten thousand people and why they're showing up, but it seems like the sort of fighting spirit mm-hmm. of this team resonated with the fans to the degree that they're, they were still showing up for games. Um, so I agree with you. It feels like this program does have some momentum, and, it, and I think the staff does feel like they're on the verge of perhaps turning a bit of a corner, even though the end of the season kind of uh, kind of ended in a sour fashion. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, you know, you have to, you have to give Brownell credit for being the guy on the sideline opposite of Coach K, opposite of Bayheim, opposite of Roy, opposite of Chris Mack, and beating them. Mm-hmm. You can be upset about the inconsistency, but to me, inconsistency is something that can be fixed and addressed when you obviously have the ability to do something, which mm-hmm. is what we've seen from this team. And I think your point about the crowds is, is really good. You say what you want about this season, but it's been exciting, and people have shown up. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's I think that's a, a big part of – of why this season has been really a lot of fun. Kelly Gramlich, big things uh, in your life right now, big things ahead. Congrats on your engagement. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Congrats on the great gig at the ACC Network, and you did a great job. I guess it was, was that the Georgia Tech game or Virginia Tech game? I forgot. Yeah, halftime, yeah. Yeah, halftime uh-huh. of that one. That was really, fun. really good job there. So uh, good luck today on your show, and thanks for joining us. Larry, you do great work as well. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thanks to Kelly Gramlich. Thanks to our sponsors, including... Title sponsor partners, Smith and Archer Law Firm in downtown Greenville, and the Abernathy for being such a good host for our interview in one of their conference rooms right off the lobby. As promised earlier, we're going to have another podcast later this week to make up for the absence of one last week. So stay tuned. Everybody have a good one.